Okay, so I'm now with my friend uh, Gailey Stevens, who um, I met um, through uh, Extinction Rebellion um, in the UK. Um, Gailey answered a call for um, someone to help me coordinate a land support group, which I set up. Um, the idea was to set up a network of land projects in the UK, including permaculture projects and all sorts of other kinds of projects that would be a base of support for rebels. Um, at the time, it was quite ambitious, and I think we both thought that Extinction Rebellion was going to be a lot bigger than it has turned out to be, and that there was going to be a lot more sort of connection with the land, and that sort of hasn't really happened yet. I hope it still will, but um, so Gailey, do you want to say anything about like the way that we met or anything or, or um, your path or how you've become disillusioned with Extinction Rebellion or? <laughs> Girl, yeah. Matt, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, hi, good morning, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how did we meet? Yeah, it was, a, it was a strange sort of call on my part. It was February last year and at one point in the last 20 years, um, I spent time in a Japanese Buddhist temple down in Milton Keynes. And I occasionally contact the nun, Mark Antoine, and just say, Nam no and check on how she's doing better. And I was impelled to do so on this particular uh, February morning. And lo and behold, at the end of the conversation, she said, have you heard of Extinction Rebellion? And I was like, no, don't know what it's like. You need to be involved in Extinction Rebellion, please go on. So it's very rare that none gives me direct orders, but that felt like a direct order. So I <laughs> leapt on the interweb and found the page and I looked through the various options and I thought, well, yeah, we can do all of those. What's the one that I'm drawn to? And it was the land project. And I thought, oh, amazing. This is exactly what we will be looking for. We've been looking for a political style um, arm, if you like, for the land-based network that exists in this country. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. There are hundreds, if not millions, of people out there who are now affected and interlinked through permaculture, the land network, walking, um, just communities in general, the rainbow tribe, it goes on and on. The, we saw when we were doing work how many people are actually out there. And Extinction Rebellion seemed to be looking at a, a really strong sort of message and saying, look, you know, we're in crisis. And this was a year ago. And this time last year, Matt, I was thinking as I was waking up this morning, we were running, the, you know, the rebellions were all underway and we were sort of gung ho for, you know, it, over that Easter weekend, you know, two weeks of on the streets in London and disruption and climate change became the headline worldwide because of what Extinction Rebellion did. And part of me thinks that what we're now going through is a direct result of human consciousness actually being raised at that point to the realization that we're killing planet. And so now suddenly we are not in a position to be killing the planet at the moment. A lot of the problems that were being created and that we do on a day-to-day -day basis start thinking have stopped. There's no planes in the sky apart from emergency transport and everything. But, you know, yes, this is a really difficult time, but it's almost as if that work a year ago with those young people leading the way created an energy and a thought form that the planet recognised as being in sympathy with it and the two work together. Now, for some people that is 
too stupid to be David Dyke type thinking, <laughs> those of us who've been around a while, actually people, it's normal, except our day-to-day -day living has got so complicated and so distracting from what is real that we can't hear it usually. But at the moment, I can assure you, most people are fine to hear it. And most people, when I speak to them, are saying, it's like, how are you doing? And people are feeling guilty because they're enjoying themselves being at home and not having to work. Now, I'm loving it. You know, this can go on all year, as far as I'm concerned, because I still won't have enough time to do all the things that I'm enjoying doing. So going back to the Extinction Rebellion thing, we took it through, we built a network, we put people and places in, and then I went to the head people and said, please can we have some money to support a particular rebellion on the edge of London where they were trying to preserve ancient Muslims. That was to do with the HS2, and I don't want to get political about that side of things, whether you agree with it or not. And they refused because it wasn't seen as being directly linked to what Extinction Rebellion were about. But for me, it was always about local communities rebelling in a local way to create maximum input and to stop some of the madness that was going on. And at the point when it was flatly refused, we're talking five thousand pounds. We weren't talking as we weren't talking like a lot of money. We were talking like five thousand pounds. And I just said, no, nope, sorry, you know. And I withdrew my labour, which is what I do if I don't agree with where something is going. Yeah. And after that it became evident that actually to me my feeling was that some people were in it were far more in it for increasing sales of their books um yeah. becoming public uh political figures they wanted into the political arena in yeah. a short way rather than they were actually interested in saving the planet yeah, which yeah. is my bottom line so at that point, I stepped away, and I haven't had anything to do with them since. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think there are quite a few people like that in in XR, and I think, um, yeah, it's it's a complex issue. I, I mean, I don't want to spend this conversation talking all about extinction rebellion. So, no. um, but. But it's great that uh, it's great that we both agree that it has had some positive impact anyway. Um, and and yeah, so um, so the first on um, the list of themes that you gave was what is the purpose of civil disobedience and and um, yeah, so maybe that has been lost in extinction rebellion. But um, um, so yeah, the first thing is maybe to raise awareness. That's a very basic thing, isn't it? That that's the least. I think that's the least that civil disobedience should do is raise awareness mm. and um, of an issue and certainly Extinction Rebellion did that very well like got in the media and so on um, um, and then you mentioned uh, that in your list of themes that it, it should support those under threat so what do you mean by that <clears throat> all right so for example, the, the Berlin Wall, right? Berlin Wall was um, a division, it was a control mechanism, and it was a threat to the peace of East Germany. And it had to come down. And that bringing all, down of the wall was an act of civil disobedience which removed that threat. Yeah. And I'm really good at uh, The move against the apartheid, although it was such a long time in doing it, 
every single one of those actions under apartheid were civil disobedience in many, many ways. And that was a lot of other cases. But if we're talking about civil disobedience for permaculture, then I guess it's um, support of birds and threats doesn't have to be humans, it could be plants. But it could be that you see um, native wildflowers as being absolutely vital to supporting insect life and pollination. And therefore, you go out and put native wildflower bumblebee pellets into places where they wouldn't not where they haven't been found introduce them into places so you stick them in people's flowers <laughs> you know you literally you go and randomly in people's gardens at night or you know there are ways of doing these things but it's sort of it's not as dramatic as the berlin wall it's not as successful as apartheid <laughs> but on a on a day to day basis, excuse me. <coughs> on a day to day basis, our pollinators are vital to life. So, yes, knowing that you have those put those wildflowers there, or as you go past them on your walk in the morning, and something else is a small act of disobedience and everything else because they're called weeds. Why would you go around planting weeds? <coughs> I'm so sorry, Matt. Hold on a second, I'll just mute the music. Yeah, don't worry. That's really interesting. I'd never thought of the Berlin Wall but of course, that's an amazing act of civil disobedience. I never really thought about that. Mm. Um, and disrupt, you mentioned disrupting controllers' power. So, I mean, that's an obvious, to me, that is the main, that's the main sort of reason for civil disobedience is to try to pressure governments or, or corporations, I guess, to change their behavior um, um and it, but it takes a lot of people and a sustained effort i think to to have effect and on that level um but i'm sure you've got a more holistic view of what disrupting controllers power means and how we can do it in our day-to-day -day lives and in a permaculture sense and and just personal like you were talking to me the other day about even even not washing for a few days or not worrying about how you look or you know can be an act of personal civil disobedience and i thought it was really good when you said on our casual chat you said um that if you keep doing stuff like that then it gets you in the right mindset for when you for when it for when it's the time to do something bigger or whatever um yeah and i think that's the whole, that's one of the things that I have to learn through my story much because I come from a middle class, aspiring middle class, because they were both working class to start with, but aspiring middle class white. Um actually I think I'm quite pink, but you know. yeah. <laughs> um sort of yeah, well educated, brought up to so please and thank you, excuse me, respect my elders. Um, very much British home values, and you know the Queen is our head of state, and you vote and you respect people, and you don't got bitter. You drive on the left-hand side of the road, and all the other rules that make up our society. You don't steal. You don't go around killing people. You know all that sort of stuff and i 20 years ago when i went through my permaculture design course um was very fortunate and i say very very fortunate to have incredible teachers and an amazing experience but at that point in my life i was a civil servant in the nhs executive 
I was a policy advisor in public health and I had a car, a microwave, I, just, I had two showers a day if I need them, kept going back to, you know, rebelling personally and things like that. And so it was, I had to go through a change. I had to be challenged in terms of what was actually important and looking at the resources I was using. Because nobody had ever questioned me. The whole of our training, the whole of our civilization, all of your newspapers, TV, and everything else is designed to turn you into a consumer. You are, you are bred to consume. Yeah. And we have an obesity epidemic successful result because those people consume to the max. And they should be getting gold stars off the company that the companies that they're, you know, consuming and everything else because they're doing such a good job for them. They should be given free branded t shirts, just like football players who play, you know, play for Nike and stuff like that. So let's go back to killing that. Let's go back to the, the thou shalt not kill, you know? Don't quash somebody's ideas, don't quash somebody's dreams, and don't take away their bodily life force because it's not a nice thing to do. You know, reincarnation could be quite painful for some people. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to be challenging civilly disobedient and looking at what a priority, then you have to look at those that kill the most. And those that kill the most are arms manufacturers. Yeah. Well, the people who at this point in time have no place on this planet yeah. are arms manufacturers. Yeah. We are in a crisis situation and they are still making bullets and tanks and chemical weapons and everything else. Those are resources on this planet which are going to be needed to maintain life and to keep the civilization that we have, our connections and everything else going. Right? Yeah. And if we if we need to do anything now, civilly disobediently, and from a greater term culture good, world good, we should those companies should be brought to halt. Yeah. Because they do nothing to help us. All they do is convert useful resources into ways of killing. And the waste and the money involved is it, it, it's gone on too long. And any government that supports them needs to be challenged to the absolute max. Yeah, no, I totally I'm agree. getting a delay. Sorry? I'm getting a, I'm getting a delay on the... It, it, they're all coming online down the valley. But it... Oh, no, it's back again now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, go on. Next. Yeah, no, <laughs> I went off a bit. <laughs> no, no, that's good. No, no, it, it's, it's... That's what how I like these conversations to flow naturally. So I'm actually reading a book. Have you heard of Naomi Klein? Yeah. She's a, she's a very prominent author, sort of left-wing journalist, author in the United States. Um, she's actually from Canada, but I think she lives in, uh, is it New York or something? Anyway, she's written some like international bestsellers books and and um, I'm reading one of hers called The Shock Doctrine right now. And, um, all right. and it's amazing. It's, it's all about how America, basically, with support from other countries, but mainly it's America, who have gone into countries over the decades and just deliberately screwed up countries and deliberately wrecked economies so that they can then bring in all these big American companies and it goes from Pinochet in the 70s in Chile to, to the Iraq war. And it goes lots of other examples in between um, about how American po foreign policy has been all about, you know, screwing up countries so that people are so bewildered that they just then accept all these foreign American companies coming in and, and, 
and just towards I'm getting towards the end of the book now and now it's actually talking about how the arms industry itself has become so profitable that that literally they will look for wars they will create wars just so that they can carry on manufacturing and it is so disgusting and if people actually realized like if if the population of this world actually realized what was going on there would be a mass uprising but the thing the problem is that people just believe seem to believe what they're told i don't understand it it's like but that goes but matt that goes back to yeah middle class bringing trained as consumers were trained um to be part of a a system and a way of life and as long as you don't sort of raise your head too much above the thing you, you don't come on to their thing you're just part of the flow of people consuming the product doing your thing and we level ourselves out we each find our place within you know we have our inner guides and whatever else we, and we get drawn to certain areas of life and some people are happy and are I think to be drawn to killing people, making life a misery for people and other aspects because they know it makes them money. Yeah. And money becomes their goal and it becomes their driving force. And that is it comes down to greed, it comes down to people wanting more than their fair share. Um at the end of the day, how many cars can you drive at one time? How many houses can you live in at any one time? How many sets of how many pairs of shoes can you wear at any one time? Yeah, and we've lost total sight. Most people are blind to this. They know that there there are the have those people with enormous, untouchable wealth, unconceivable wealth. And there are those who are so poor that they haven't, you know, they struggle to find the cardboard box to live in. Yeah. But for the majority of people, they're in that middle, what's being created is the comfort zone. Because if you keep the majority comfortable, the majority will never rise up now. Only when people become uncomfortable, either in their own soul or in their physical situation, that they do something about it. And even then, not all of them do. No. You know, it it can take such an awful lot to motivate somebody to get them going, especially if they've never been trained. And XR did this well. XR trained people well in civil disobedience, right? And yeah. how to be politely disobedient. Yeah? How to be, to, to disobey, but be polite about it. Especially in this country. And, that, <laughs> and that's crucial. Yeah? Well, most people take civil disobedience. I mean, you're, just, you're going against society, but you're not necessarily. You no. could be being politely disobedient against the army manufacturer, against those people who are spraying chemicals on the side of the road, you know, who are thrashing the hedges in August and taking off all the berries and things like this. There's a whole range of things going on in our world which are not right. They're just not right, Matt. And it's not one thing. It's not, and it's not government's fault. It's all of our individual fault yeah. for not recognising that we have been controlled for so long. And we have. And so in a way, permaculture is a very quiet, very gentle, very strong way of saying, actually, don't like the way you do things, so I'm going to, I'm politely going to disobey. I'm not going to consume these things that you put in front of me. I am not going to watch your daily broadcast and be influenced 
by it. I am not necessarily going to wash my hair every day, twice a day. I might not shave for a week. Now I'll tell you, I can give some blokes a right good run for a money on a beard, you <laughs> know? And it, Matt, there are so many things that we are trained to be and to want to, to be part of. And our technology and our ability now to communicate and to reach across the whole planet is something I hope we never ever move through this. But we've got to realise that for the majority of people, even just changing the daily newspaper they read for a different perspective is it, it is unthinkable. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I know. I, 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 I could possibly, I couldn't read that. That's the opposition. Yeah. And no people aren't prepared to open their minds enough even to look at what the other side is saying. So how can you possibly at this point, reach to people and say, hello, wake up, you're being conned. You know, you are all free thinking, free world people, unless you've chosen to give that will away. And if you've given your will away, you can still get it back. You can claim it back any moment just by saying, just do something. One thing that you wouldn't normally do that feels a bit naughty and a bit, yeah. oh, you yeah. know, you know, so you know, the first time I went a day without having a shower, I just, oh, oh, so uncomfortable with myself, you know, that, yeah. oh. But it, it's the process. It's not an instant fix. It's a process. You know, it's that questioning. It's that looking at everything that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and saying, is this because this is what I want to do and it adds to my joy and it keeps my routine sane and whatever else? Or is this something I've been trained to do? Is this something that I, I'm pushing these buttons, I'm buying this stuff, I'm I'm driving to the shop, whatever it may be, driving to the shop. Is it because actually underlying it, that's what they want me to do? I'm consuming. Yeah, no, yeah, I've never really, I've never really realised it so strongly before, but um, yeah, obviously the permaculture kind of principle of, um, of consuming well only what you really need to and and of and of closed mm. systems that of, of 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 inputs becoming outputs and vice versa sorry outputs becoming inputs so zero you we're aiming for zero waste aren't we yeah, yeah so 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 the thing of um and use something as many times as you can so yeah. multiple uses multiple functions turn things on their head. You yeah. remember I was telling you about the fire pit earlier and my um, interesting uh, explorations, archaeology almost, I would say. <laughs> it really was archaeology. And um, just shows the thing was right on top of where my house is. And, yeah. Yeah. And I, I rescued, that's a good way of putting it, I rescued an old incinerator uh, a couple of years back and everything that was being took by somebody else and it was really getting a little bit worse square and in my head I had this wild idea that if I could dig the fire pit big enough I could sink the incinerator into it and then clay over it and with the air tube filtering at the bottom and everything I'd get a really good burn. Yeah. Anyway, it didn't quite work. It's got wheels on the back and I couldn't get them off. I couldn't get my bolt cutters open. Who thought it? <laughs> and then it's all, and I was like, oh, I know. I'll just turn it upside down. 
take the door off, I could get the door off, <laughs> I'll just yeah. turn it upside down. So I inverted. And actually, as a, as a concept, it was fine. But it didn't work. It just didn't work. Yeah. But the point is, permaculture is about trying different ways of doing things. Yeah, it's a bit like Edison and light bulb. 9,999 times you've tried different ways and different methods to create the filament and to get the gas in the chair and all the other things that it takes to actually make a light bulb and then get it to go with electricity in it. Yeah. And the cops a bit like that sometimes. But we do an awful lot of work on paper or in sand. I do, I've got chalkboards around the place. I put uh, blackboards up and do designs on chalkboards and things like that because patterns are what make people. We're part of nature. Nature is full of patterns, incredible patterns. And if we can find patterns that work, then they will work over and over again. And you can replicate them. And a lot of what we're trying to teach with permaculture is successful pattern making and how to integrate that into your own life. So you take that on to civil disobedience, consuming, the problems that we're dealing with, armed manufacturers, save a pattern, right, in their own way. And they again can be analysed and broken down. And if you want to be civilly disobedient, or if you want to uh, challenge those particular areas that you're unhappy with, the first thing to do is understand the pattern, look at it, break it down, and then work out where the actual the key energy comes in at. So it's all one. It's all well and good going and demonstrating with an arms fair if you have some, um, where they're selling the end product. But it's far more powerful to take away their supply line. So if you want to disrupt an arms manufacturer, you need to know where they're getting the raw materials from exactly. and those supply lines. Yeah? I totally agree. And that's what permaculture teaches. It's no good going and standing outside the headquarters of the organisation and everything, because that's just the public space. That yeah. doesn't okay, unless they're just paper pushers, in which case they're not real anyway. But when they're at, when you're actually dealing with people who are manufacturing um, destruction, then the thing, the only way to deal with it is to actually remove their supply line. So it's the case of the information is there on the internet. Put together the pattern. Check out where they're getting the stuff and then remove the resources. And if they can't secure the resources, they can't manufacture the end project. I know, I know. It, it, I don't understand why more civil disobedience hasn't looked at these um, um, targets, for want of a better word, because um, you know, a lot of social movements and civil disobedience seems to be about um, going going for targets which, in a peaceful way, obviously, which uh, get a lot of press attention. And, it, and and press attention is important, don't get me wrong, but it seems to me that, yeah, what you're saying has been ignored far too much, that there are obvious weak, it's like there are weak spots in infrastructures where, which are ripe for being disobedient around. I mean, some people do it. Some people do it. Like, you know, you do hear of people sometimes shutting off, turning off pipelines and stuff in America. There has been small groups of people have shut, have like, literally, they just turn off the pipeline, like, for a couple of days. And that's quite good. Yeah. Um, but we need more stuff like that, I think. Um, well, it's the case of what's the priority, isn't it? At any one time, that we only have this one moment, right? So at any point in time, it's what is the greatest threat 
what is the thing that needs to change the most and that's where we should be focusing the civil disobedience. It's not, it's a bit like take the permaculture analogy of the garden. When you go out into your garden, most gardeners will tell you, the first thing you do is you have a quick walk around and check everything's all right. Make a bit of a note of, oh, oh, bit of, mm, 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 mm. maybe an instant bit of deadheading as you, you know, up in your hot water and lemon juice. And then you get on with the rest of the day. <clears throat> and it could be you do your watering or you do some transplanting or you plant some seeds or whatever it is. But the first thing you do is have a look and a check. And at the moment, the priority from a civil disobedience point of view to me is that we're in unprecedented times. Yeah. You know, for me, civil disobedience now is hmm. Do I drill into the outside of the house because that's part of my housing association rules? I must not, but I actually have to do with a couple of extra fixings. Um, it's really minor because the last thing I want to do at the moment is create um, is the idea in people's heads that they should be going out and um, disrupting uranium mines or um, whatever it may be yeah i mean that was an extreme example but to me at the moment the most important thing is that it, we're in planning stage yeah we're actually in a real life planning this season is going to happen again as we move through the, what the coronavirus is bringing to us in this world we need to be thinking way beyond what they're thinking and how we want the world to be when we go forward. So the immediate threat is to people's lives and people are understandably really scared. But I don't understand why, because any one of us could die at any day. This hasn't touched on normal flu epidemic figures even yet, no. we, don't get, we don't get a day-to-day -day broadcast on the normal flu figures. I know, whatever. I know, it's a bit weird. So let's just, let's just get a little bit politically controversial for a moment. Go for it. Right? So you've got a virus that comes out of China that was developed in an American lab. Okay. So what? What's your answer? Have you got like a good link for that so I can put it under the video? Is there evidence for that then? I'll see if I can find it. I need to go back to the person who told me who said they've okay. seen it. Okay. Um, then you're talking about China locks down and they extend the country isn't even affected because of the size of it. So they've got a very controlled test area. Then you've got it coming out into the rest of the world and the rest of the world panic. Now why? Yes, it's a really natural noisy, painful death. I get that. Human beings all have this dream that we're all going to die with enlightenment and nirvana and all the rest of it, but actually that's not the case for most people. <laughs> we're losing as many people through so many other ways that people die every day, and yet we don't get those figures. So what's the purpose of this? And then a couple of days ago, we get an announcement. Google and Apple are going to be working together with smartphone providers to be able to give current data input from all smartphone users as to location and whatever else. And they're developing an app, which if you've had coronavirus, it will, it will actually put an app onto your phone so that you will be targeted and monitored as the coronavirus victim to find out where you're going and where you've been and use data analysis and all this amazing stuff we can now do to find out who you've been in contact with. They're going to use it as a social distancing measure so they'll be able to upload where, how close you are to other people and whatever else. 
we're going to be talking about clean zones. So if you've got no apps on showing on phones in a particular area and you're clean as well, you'll be able to go there without any worry about social distancing. Oh so God. to be used as a type of screening worldwide. This is totalitarianism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Matt, what about how about the really sinister, potentially scary thought that actually this is what they've been aiming for all along with the Chinese tech giants and everything. These guys don't care about the name of the country. The guys we're talking about, the guys who are the problem that we we are really up against when it comes to this. And I'm sorry, on the majority they aren't like there's only a couple of women involved in this. These guys don't see borders. They don't give a monkey to them. This is all about control. This is all about being able to, and they press a worldwide panic button and it worked. Right? We are all of us in fear, whether we admit it or not. This message has reached home to people in a way. I don't disagree that yes, this is a horrible death. And no, we do not want to overwhelm our health service with yeah. people coughing themselves to death. Of course. Right? However, there is a bigger picture here. Okay. This thing has not just come out of some little tiny town, no, huge Chinese tech town where they developed these viruses, right? This is all starting to look very much like a pattern that they, each time they build a pattern, they build another step and they succeeded. We have lockdown. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah, well, personally, um, I think, uh, yeah, the virus seems to be definitely a real virus, but, but the way it's been, I don't know whether it's a bioweapon or not, but even if it's not, the response to it is still totally, yeah, seems like, and, and what you're saying about Google and Apple, that doesn't surprise me, and, it, and that shows the kind of, yeah, technological totalitarianism, uh, and, and it's a capitalist, like ultra-capitalist. Um, they're basically trying to, it's what I've been reading about in Shock Doctrine. It's 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 the, the coronavirus is shocking the pop. They're using they're using the virus to put populations into shock, so that so that they can then impose these technologies, and it's yeah. and it's in cahoots. The big gov the governments and the big companies are uh, uh, it's like revolving doors. They're all they're they're in it together. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the makeup of some of the boards of some of these companies. You see yeah. the politicians that sit on it, or the sons of politicians, or the. I mean, for God's sake, mate, Trump is absolutely the classic example of the human race gone mad when it comes to electing a politician. You know, I mean, he's blatant with it, and yet they're so we're so trained. I can't say I am anymore, but. They're so trained, Matt, that we're, you know, they bought it. Yeah. They bought it. And so we have controlling the, you know, and look at the disaster that is America. And I would imagine that he's letting it do this because as far as he's concerned, there's too many people in America. It'll probably take the poor ones and that's a few less to work. And that may be cynical, Matt. But that's true. Oh yeah. And then there's, a, there's another really nasty, nasty aspect to this, and that is the questions that are being asked about why this virus appears to be particularly susceptible in the Asian and Black communities. They're getting yeah. three out of four times higher hit rate, and that shouldn't be possible if it's a natural flu. Flu affects people which are, however, equally, not then. AIDS didn't work. They tried it with AIDS, it didn't 
work. And of course, there are those who are working on the good side of things who are looking for a vaccine now, but they've made this thing so complicated. You know, they're on version 19 now. What happens when they get to version 35? Yeah, so the vaccine, yeah. is some, the, 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 the vaccine is something I'm worried about because you've got Google and Apple, you know, making these apps to track people more. But what about, what I'm worried about is, um, I mean, I, I spoke to someone yesterday and they said they didn't think it could ever happen. But if they can get us, if they can pass laws to keep us in our homes, can they pass laws to make a vaccine mandatory? Yeah. Because I, I'm not, if somebody tells me I have to have a vaccine, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to take, you know. No, um, I'm like, I'm not. And they, just so that you know, they have done clinical trials on the microchipping, right? Um, and I know this, I cannot tell you anymore. And they worked. So from that point of view, you've got the potential to get into a, a mass population, you've got the potential to put microchips into people, whether they know it or not, and have cut and have located. And that's really what they're itching to do. That's really what they want. They want to be able to, in real time, pinpoint anybody, dead or alive. I mean, let's face it, if somebody's murdered, it's a nightmare trying to find somebody's body that nut has gone off and buried them in the woods somewhere or, you know, put them on the local dump and they don't know. I mean, you know, I I get you want you said people, but really, do we really want that human race microchip? I don't think so. I really don't. And I think that there's got to be a question of is civil disobedience at the point where you individually say I'm not prepared to take that vaccine or is it actually to encourage a greater population to question whether or not that vaccine is going to be of any benefit at all. A vaccine in its own right will always give you mild symptoms of what it is that you're being vaccinated against. That's how it works. It builds up your immune system. What happens if the vaccine also makes you really, really sick? You know, a lot of vaccines do create additional complications. Is it really worth it? You know, wouldn't it be better just to modify our lifestyles and look about how we've been living and whether or not a simpler life a less complicated a life, a more home orientated life isn't actually better. And that we get together once on a full moon, you know, in family groups or something like that. We look at changing our social behaviour and patterns. Not because we are not social animals, but because we are and would like to see a way through this. And at the moment, there is no exit strategy. There is no way through. They, they have us and they have the population in fear. And while we are not watching, they can do whatever they want. Yeah. Danny, yeah, so this and can, I could have myself up by then and we give us the next interview in the garden. Yeah, so this is yeah, two part a two part thing's good. Um and you've really set my mind off with I'm going to be doing some more research into um, where the virus has come from. And if you could, if you can ask your friend again, like um, if, 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 if I can get a link to, to some information on where, you know, the idea. I think, I think he said it was on YouTube. Right, right. I've got to try, I'm pretty sure it's happening. Okay. Oh, quick bit of feedback from one of my mentors. Uh, YouTube video the split. Okay, you need to check that out. It's a uh, second part of uh, Age of Stupid. Did you see Age of Stupid? 
Age of Cupid. Cupid. Oh, Age of Stupid. I think I might have seen that. I don't know. I might have done, yeah. Yeah, check out Age of Stupid and then their next one is called Slip and it's all about now. Slip? Flip. Oh, Flip. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay, great. Okay, I haven't seen it yet. I have seen Age of Stupid. Yeah. And a book to look out for, Matt, is called Donut Economics. I've heard about it. Yeah. Yeah, Jim's reading that at the moment because it's really, really good. Okay. You know, it deals very well with the fair shares and idea and greed and, again, the corporate stuff. So. Great.